Good comes to us from uh, Columbus, Ohio, where he's an assistant professor of biomedical engineering and also a member of the Davis Institute for Cardiovascular Directing Research. Close. Heart and lung. Heart and lung. Heart and lung. Heart and lung. <laughs> Forget the lung. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Tom uh, received his undergraduate. Uh, degree from uh, Duke University in Biomedical Engineering, and then he came to this uh, notorious laboratory at Case Western Reserve University where he did his PhD, and after that came to Washington University for a brief stay. How long was it for you? Three years. Three years. Not so, not so brief stay. <coughs> for a postdoc um, with some of the people that are here and some that are not here and then went to University of Iowa and from Iowa to Columbus. And he's done work both in modeling and experiments and his really focus of interest is in cardiac excitability and cardiac excitation and the role of regulatory pathways, in particular the chem kinase. So thank you very much, I can't, I can't tell you how how much fun today has been and uh, how excited I am to be here. Um, thank Dr. Rudy for the opportunity to, to come back to some old stopping grounds and, um, and talk with you. Um, mostly I'm going to share uh, with you uh, a set of experiments and uh, some, some, some mathematical modeling looking at, uh, as Dr. Rudy mentioned, the role of uh, CAM kinase, which many Many of you in the audience who have known me are probably, probably sick of hearing me talk about this because uh, a lot of the research that we're doing actually started in with uh, projects in Cleveland with uh, Dr. Rudy and then actually continued here at WashU and uh, um, and so I hope to show you this, how the story has developed over the years to, to where we are now. Um, so I'd be remiss um, if I didn't uh, do, do some advertising for uh, uh, the, the Davis Heart and Lung Research Institute. So uh, the the DHLRI is a uh, it's a standalone uh, institute at OSU, uh, right on the the Med Center complex. Uh, our lab is actually up here on the sixth floor, just around the corner here. Uh, in the in the institute itself, there are about 70 <coughs> PIs with uh, space for core labs and shared equipment, animal facilities. So a really, a really uh, excellent uh, institute. It's about uh, 10 years old. Um, and while in the building itself there are about 70 people, altogether there are over uh, 200 uh, institute members around, around <coughs> campus. Um, one uh, important uh, constituent of the, of the institute is the, is, uh, the BME department, um, which was actually established uh, as a center in the 70s, but uh, we only recently started our undergrad program. Uh, in 2008. There are 17 uh, faculty with uh, diverse interests but a, a, a big focus on cardiovascular. So uh, um, our, uh, our research is, is very interested in, in uh, cell, uh, cell membrane excitability um, and you know we've known for a, a long time, for decades now, that genetic defects in genes that encode for ion channels result in cardiac arrhythmia and death and uh, more recently we've, we've uh, grown to appreciate the fact that um, defects not just in ion channels but in accessory proteins and regulatory molecules uh, can also result in death uh, highlighting the uh, the importance of uh, ion channel macromolecular complexes for maintaining uh, spatial and temporal control over uh, the activity of ion channels and importantly, we know that uh, disruption of these uh, complexes and associated signaling domains is associated with disease in, in a variety of excitable cells, but for our interest uh, in, in cardiac arrhythmia. So uh, our, our lab is really interested in the fundamental question of how these uh, ion channel complexes are organized in uh, myocytes and uh, what role they play in, in disease. Uh, specifically, we're, uh, we're actually interested in, in complexes that are responsible for controlling a, a specific signaling pathway, uh, calcium calmodulin-dependent protein kinase. 
Uh, this kinase actually is uh, ubiquitously expressed. It's uh, activated by calcium calmodulin. Um, and it's actually known to regulate a, a, a pretty wide array of, uh, of physiological functions from uh, organelle transport to uh, synaptic plasticity to uh, excitation contraction con uh, coupling in, in myocytes. And uh, importantly, um, mounting data indicate that CAM kinase dysfunction in uh, a variety of disease states, including human heart failure, uh, is, is problematic both for function and for arrhythmias. So uh, our, our interest in CAM kinase actually began in Cleveland in, in uh, Dr. Rudy's lab, where we were trying to answer fundamental questions about how uh, electrical remodeling in the infarcted canine heart uh, resulted in electrical dysfunction. And uh, along the way, actually, we stumbled upon uh, uh, CAM kinase as a, as a potential uh, important player in not just uh, the normal function of the cardiac cell, but, but also in disease. So we, uh, we developed a, a mathematical model of the, of the ventricular myocyte of the canine uh, here I show just a cartoon, which, which I'm sure everyone in this audience is familiar with these kinds of cartoons at this point, but we just illustrate here the, the major ion channels that uh, underlie the action potential in the uh, canine myocyte. Uh, and we were able to incorporate a, uh, a dynamic pathway for activation of CAMP kinase and subsequent phosphorylation of, of downstream uh, targets, including uh, calcium channels and uh, calcium cycling proteins. And so um, we were able to show that actually that due to its uh, unique properties, CAM kinase is ideally suited to detect the frequency of pacing in these cells. Um, and, uh, but more importantly, we uh, were interested in applying this model to try and understand how, um, what role CAM kinase might play in abnormal uh, cell excitability and disease. And uh, in studies actually that, that began here at WashU, we actually were able to uh, assess uh, CAMP kinase levels in uh, the canine infarct border zone. And this is a, a region in the infarcted canine heart where arrhythmias are highly localized. And, uh, and actually we were able to, to um, uh, test predictions of the model that, that CAMP kinase dysfunction uh, could, could create a substrate for arrhythmias. We found actually dramatic increase in uh, levels of, of active CAM kinase in the infarct border zone. And then in subsequent studies, we've been able to incorporate these data into uh, mathematical models of the CAM kinase molecule and the whole cell and, and uh, ultimately uh, models of, the, of cardiac tissue uh, to be able to illustrate how uh, dysfunction in CAM kinase signaling uh, can result in, uh, in abnormal calcium cycling, but also in uh, abnormal uh, conduction. And so uh, these, these studies were, were very interesting for us and, um, and I think helped, helped illustrate how CAMP kinase is positioned to serve as a nodal point for, um, for <coughs> mechanical and electrical dysfunction in, in disease cells. But, but at the end of the day, I think these, these studies actually raised uh, uh, maybe more questions than they, they answered for me. Um, and one of the big questions was, you know, if you look at CAM kinase in a sick cell, it, you know, one, it's not everywhere. It's at specific locations in the cell. And then even more importantly, when you look at a sick cell and you look at where the CAM kinase is activated and where it localizes, it's in, it's in very specific domains where we see these defects. So um, I became very interested in, in how, um, how is CAMP kinase signaling compartmentalized in the cell, especially when you have a, a molecule like CAMP kinase which targets so many different proteins? How, how, uh, what pathways has the cell evolved to uh, maintain um, sensitivity in this complex system? And so actually at uh, University of Iowa, uh, in collaboration with uh, the, uh, uh, Peter Moeller and Mark Anderson, um, we actually started to look at uh, molecular pathways that might be uh, might play a role in CAM kinase targeting. We actually took a clue from uh, 
studies done uh, on the, the beta 2A subunit of the L-type calcium channel. So this uh, calcium channel is, is a, uh, a very important target for, for CAM kinase. And obviously it's very important for uh, excitation contraction coupling in, in myocytes. Um, and uh, what uh, doctors uh, Moeller and Anderson had discovered was that actually the beta 2A subunit of the L-type calcium channel contains a, a conserved uh, motif for CAM kinase binding that's present in uh, other known uh, binding partners for CAM kinase, including the uh, uh, NR2B uh, subunit of the NMDA receptor, as well as um, a part of the kinase itself. Um, and actually, uh, in these studies, they were able to show that if they, if they uh, disrupted, if they uh, mutated key residues in this binding motif, that they could eliminate not only CAM kinase binding to the subunit, but also normal regulation of L-type uh, calcium channel activity. So this was a, uh, uh, so actually using this, this motif, we did a computational screen of the human genome for other potential uh, binding partners. And uh, we were actually very surprised that the, that the list was pretty short. I mean, you know, this is a screen of the entire uh, genome. It produced about uh, 30 candidates. Uh, including uh, cytoskeletal proteins, membrane proteins, mitochondrial, nuclear. So a, a, a pretty interesting uh, group of candidate proteins. But um, actually towards the top of this list, uh, among the most uh, conserved, uh, with, the, with the, actually some of the highest homology to this uh, binding motif, was a, a protein called uh, beta-4 spectrin. Uh, and, uh, the, the spectrum family, I'll, I'll talk more about what, what, the, what these proteins do, but these are uh, uh, important cytoskeletal proteins that, that uh, bind to actin, um, as well as adapter proteins and, uh, and uh, ion channels, and are known to be very important for uh, cell structure in a, in a pretty diverse array of cells, including uh, myocytes. Um, and so we, were, uh, we, we focused in on this uh, beta-4 spectrum uh, as I said, uh, uh, spectrins are, are uh, cytoskeletal proteins that are very important for organizing uh, cell membrane. Um, in fact, uh, here's an, an, uh, an early figure, an early cartoon of the proposed role of spectrin in, in red blood cells, where uh, spectrin forms a, a geodesic-like dome, uh, dome structure with uh, associated proteins like ancran and, and uh, actin to provide uh, integrity for the red blood cell membrane. Here I show an EM picture of this uh, very fine structure in a red blood cell. And uh, interestingly, uh, mutations, human mutations were identified in spectrum that resulted in uh, uh, hemolytic anemia as well as uh, uh, an ataxia. And actually, uh, spectrum mutations are the primary cause of hereditary anemia. Uh, and, and actually what, what happens, here's an example of, uh, of uh, the role that spectrum plays in, in uh, cell structure. Here's a, a normal red blood cell with that nice biconcave shape. Uh, here are red blood cells from a human patient with a, uh, a mutation in spectrum. You can see that the, that the uh, biconcave shape is lost. You get these spherical red blood cells which are, uh, which are um, actually uh, destroyed and uh, resulting uh, in an anemia. So these spectrins first identified with blood cells. We now know uh, that it plays similar roles in neurons and in myocytes and, and in a bunch of cells. So, uh, so we hypothesized that one, uh, this beta-4 spectrin could be uh, playing an important structural role in myocytes, but that furthermore with the uh, presence of this CAM kinase binding site that it could be playing a secondary role, uh, uh, an interesting role in, in regulation. So not only in pri providing structure for the membrane, but also in bringing uh, and creating a, a macromolecular complex. So here's a, a cartoon of beta-4 spectrin. This uh, spectrin is highly expressed in neurons and actually had, had only been studied in neurons uh, before, before our work. Uh, it has an N-terminal actin binding domain 
a series of uh, spectrum repeats where it binds uh, proteins like anchorin and, and uh, other adapter proteins. And then a, uh, a C-terminal domain, which is actually where this putative CAM kinase binding site is located. Importantly, here I show the alignment of uh, spectrum across species and with uh, CAM kinase itself. And you can see that this binding motif is, is highly conserved across species. And uh, using uh, biochemistry, we were able to show that, that CAM kinase is capable of binding directly to this motif in the C-terminal end of uh, beta-4 spectrum. Uh, so that's, that's great, but um, you know, the study kind of stops there if spectrum isn't, isn't in heart. Um, and as I mentioned, it had been studied only in neurons. So first we wanted to see whether uh, beta-4 spectrum was in heart and uh, where it was located. And so here I show some uh, images. We, we used a variety of techniques, including um, immunoprecipitation and immunofluorescence to, to uh, show that uh, not only is beta-4 spectrum expressed in myocytes, these are uh, isolated uh, rat ventricular myocytes, but that it's, it's found in very specific uh, part of the cell, uh, namely the intercalated disc where uh, cells come in mechanical and electrical contact. Here, uh, NCAT here is used as a marker for the disc, so you can see that uh, where this uh, spectrum is localized. And uh, again, if beta-4 spectrin and cam kinase can interact only in the, in the test tube, but, but don't reside at same, the same domain in, in heart cells, then again, this interaction couldn't be very important. So here I show uh, where cam kinase is in the cell, and I mentioned that it's at very specific domains, namely uh, at the T-tubules, where um, uh, L-type calcium channels reside. But you can see that there's a, a secondary population also at the cell ends in the region of the interpolated disc. So, uh, so that's fine. Beta-4 spectrin and uh, CAM kinase can interact. They, they're found in uh, the same place in the cell. Um, but of course, we wanted to find out what else would be in this uh, complex. And here I just show a, a summary cartoon um, using uh, a variety of techniques, we were able to show that uh, beta. Uh, this is a this is the uh, voltage-gated sodium channel that is very important for the uh, the rapid upstroke in the cardiac myocyte. Um, that voltage-gated sodium channels, uh, anchorin G, which is an adapter protein that's very important for targeting uh, the sodium channel and binds to beta-4 spectrin, uh, are uh, integral members of this, uh, this ion channel complex. And so the hypothesis uh, going forward was that beta-4 spectrum served as a, a, as a scaffold that would bring uh, cam kinase together with its uh, target ion channel, namely the uh, voltage-gated sodium channel. So um, again, this is, this, is, uh, this is interesting, but uh, you know, the next step um, how can we how can we study what this complex is doing? So we've established that beta-4 spectrin uh, resides in a complex with these proteins, but what's what's the functional role? So here we got actually uh, a pretty lucky um, in that we were able to exploit uh, a uh, a mouse model available at Jackson Labs, um, and as it turns out, in the 90s, a whole slew of spontaneous uh, mutant mice were identified uh, that had mutations in the beta-4 spectrin uh, gene that resulted in truncation of the protein to varying degrees. Uh, the, the least severe truncation, uh, referred to as the QV3J, the QV stands for quivering because <coughs> uh, the mice eventually develop an ataxia due to the, the uh, neural defect. But the QV3J has a very, a very uh, slight truncation just before the cam kinase binding motif in beta-4 spectrum. And so uh, this was extremely fortuitous because the, uh, the rest of the spectrum molecule is intact. So the, it can still bind actin, the protein is still expressed, it still targets to the intercalated disc, 
It's just uh, that it, can't, it can no longer bind uh, CAM kinase. So it's a very uh, nice model to study the targeted disruption of CAM kinase and beta-4 spectrum in, in the heart. And so in fact, when we look at uh, what happens to CAM kinase localizations uh, to, to this complex in these cells, uh, first, the, the interpolated disk is, is intact. Um, here we use the NCAT here and again as the marker. Uh, Voltage-gated sodium channels and anchorin I don't show, but ANC-G are localized normally. But we lose uh, this subpopulation of CAM kinase that's found at the interpolated disk. So uh, we have a targeted disruption in CAM kinase spectrum interaction. And also note that while we can uh, we can no longer see CAM kinase at the cell end, that the intracellular population uh, appears uh, undisturbed. So we're able to, uh, so we don't have a blanketed uh, disruption of CAM kinase signaling. Instead, it's a very targeted uh, defect, which allows us to isolate the, the role of this regulatory event. So then uh, with this mouse model, we were able to go ahead and, and characterize the electrophysiology. So here I'm showing uh, sodium channel measurements from uh, wild type and QV3J uh, myocytes. And uh, I'm going to show a bunch, of, a bunch of curves here, so just to help orient us. Um, CAM kinase has a, has a very distinct signature for regulation of the sodium channel. So uh, several groups have established that CAM kinase uh, changes sodium channel activity by reducing the availability of the channel and by increasing uh, late current. So it's, it's a kind of a, it's a confusing phenotype where you have a, a gain of function combined with a, a loss of function. I wouldn't say confusing, but comp complex. Um, and so in the 3J, we're hypothesizing that the CAM kinase regulation is, is disrupted. Um, and in fact, if we look at uh, sodium channel uh, properties <coughs> in the 3J mouse, we see uh, uh, increase availability as evidenced by a, a rightward shift in the steady state and activation curve. Uh, and we see decreased uh, late current. Consistent with our uh, hypothesis that the spectrin uh, CAM kinase interaction is, is essential for the ability of CAM kinase to regulate uh, sodium channels. Uh, and so uh, that's that's fine. Uh, the next step was to try and uh, gain more information about how this regulation is occurring. Is it is it through uh, direct phosphorylation um, or some secondary pathway? Um, and while several groups had, had established the, the signature of CAM kinase dependent regulation, the site for CAM kinase phosphorylation had uh, not been identified. So actually we created a, a library of uh, sodium channel constructs where we mutated each uh, putative phosphorylation site uh, in the intracellular domains of NAV 1.5 to from uh, serines to alanine, so they couldn't be phosphorylated. And then we uh, characterize, this is all done in uh, HEK cells. We uh, express these channels in HEKs with and without CAM kinase. And uh, really, uh, when we did these experiments, one, one mutant jumped out, and that was this uh, channel where we mutated serine 571 in the D1, D2 loop to an alanine. Um, and you can see here that in the presence of CAM kinase, while all the other constructs show the uh, characteristic leftward shift, there's no change uh, in this S571A mutant. And the same is true for if you look at the L-type current or the late current or, um, or some other uh, properties. And so uh, based on these data, we actually developed a phospho-specific antibody for phosphorylation at serine 571. Here I show uh, blots from uh, wild type and 3J uh, heart lysates, and you can see that just at baseline, there's a, a dramatic reduction in the levels of phosphorylated sodium channel at serine 571. So now we've uh, we've identified that uh, CAM kinase, that actually beta-4 spectrum brings CAM kinase together with sodium channel, so it can directly phosphorylate the channel. Um, and then naturally, we wanted to uh, 
understand how, uh, what's the ultimate consequence for cell excitability. And uh, here I show action potentials measured from uh, ventricular uh, myocytes from wild type and uh, 3J cells over a range of pacing frequency. And uh, we see uh, a dramatic uh, shortening of action potential duration as you'd expect uh, based on the loss of late sodium current. And we also see uh, a decrease in the ability of the action potential to adapt to pacing rate. Uh, these are uh, surface electrocardiograms measured from a uh, wild type and a 3J mouse. And we see, uh, as you predict, based on uh, what we know about cam kinase regulated soy channels, we see defects in uh, QRS duration, QT, and, uh, and also heart rate. And finally, we wanted to uh, test whether this complex would play any role in, in susceptibility to uh, arrhythmias. So uh, for this, we, we challenged uh, wild type and 3J myocytes with a high dose of isoproteranol, uh, which in a subset of wild type cells induced uh, an arrhythmogenic uh, after depolarization. Uh, but 3J myocytes were totally resistant to uh, the formation of these after depolarizations. And we could, we could block these uh, after depolarizations in <coughs> wild type cells uh, with mixilatine a dose uh, sufficient to block the late component. So, uh, so just to uh, summarize up to this point, um, we've identified uh, beta-4 spectrin as a, as a novel anchoring protein for CAM kinase at the myocyte uh, intercalated disc. Um, and what's interesting is, is you know, CAM kinase is different from other signaling molecules, for example, PK, uh, uh, PKA or PKC, where we've identified uh, families of proteins. So in the case of PKA, we have, uh, we have ACAPs, which are proteins whose specific purpose is to target PKA. We don't, we don't really have a homologous family for CAM kinase. Instead, it seems that these, uh, these binding sequences are embedded in substrates or, or something like that. But, um, here, we feel that uh, beta-4 spectrum can serve as, as, uh, as an analog to these ACAPs where it's able to anchor CAM kinase with its, uh, with its substrates. And importantly, this uh, interaction is important for the ability of CAM kinase to regulate um, sodium channels and, and cell excitability. Uh, these studies, we also identified uh, that CAM kinase is able to regulate uh, sodium channel activity by directly phosphorylating uh, specific sites, serine 571 in the D1, D2 loop. Um, it's, it's likely that, well, while our studies indicate that this is an important site, it's likely that, that there, are, there are others that work in concert with phosphorylation at the site that are probably a little more complicated than just coming down to a single site, but, but clearly our, our data illustrate that um, this serine is, is an important player. And finally, uh, disruption of this uh, signaling complex results in abnormal function uh, and cell excitability. And here I just show a, a cartoon from a, a commentary associated with our paper uh, illustrating uh, the uh, role of this complex in, in the myocyte. Tom, before you go on, yeah. what, what is the mechanism for the effect on heart rate? So that's a great question. That, that's actually a whole other area that we're looking at now. So we've actually um, uh, isolated sinus node cells from these uh, 3J animals. And not only is, so one, surface ECG show this difference in heart rate. Uh, isolated heart, you see differences in heart rate. And if you look at spontaneous action potentials, uh, they're faster, they're significantly faster in, in the 3J. Sinus node cells. So, we're, we're not sure. We've we're, we're actually just in the beginning of trying to characterize because obviously the in the in the uh, sinus node cell the sodium current's not going to be you know, as important as it would be in the ventricular cell. But um, we're yeah we're in the process of trying to figure it out. The the interesting thing is that for these studies we've really focused on the sodium channel because we have good assays for assessing activity. Um, but but this spectrum isn't, you know, this is just sort of the beginning of the, the story. I mean, Anchorin G is, 
belongs to this family of anchoring proteins that the, the Moeller lab has studied extensively, and they've showed that it's responsible for targeting a, a, a wide variety of ion channels. So um, through this interaction with NG, we have access to not just the sodium channel, but a large number of ion channels and, and uh, uh, structural proteins as well. But, um, so, but from, so from your localization of those things, it, channels that are not located in the intercalated disc or the T-tubules are not regulated by chem um, So by according to the... Is that true? Yeah. So well, so a lot of the, you know, I would say that most of the known targets have at least some population that are... Right, so the population that's in the intercalated disc or the T-tubule is regulated. That's right. It's not in either one of those places, it's not. There could be a subpopulation of channels that are not experiencing any of the any, any, any yeah. kind of regulation. Yeah, that's that's our picture. Um, <clears throat> you know, the other thing is that there are there are plenty of data at this point to su to suggest that um, that there's there's likely not just uh, a population of the sodium channel associated with ink G and. Uh, beta-4 spectrum, but that there's actually probably two populations at least of sodium channels within the intercalated disk. So not even, um, we can't even say for certain that all voltage-gated sodium channels in the disk are going to be part of this complex. I mean, it's true for the LPEP, because not all LPEP is in the Right, right. Um, so do patients who have these spectrum Defects show any cardiac phenotype besides the, the other? You know, so the mutations that have been identified so far have not been in the beta four. They've been in in uh, isoforms <coughs> that are specific for the brain or or in the red blood cell. Um, so there's some data. So the the isoform in the red blood cell is very is, is only found in in red red blood cells. That's the only place it's found. So those patients just show the the anemia. The, the isoform in the brain actually is expressed in low levels in heart, and there are some data that there's some uh, some crossover. But the beta-4, we're, we're, we're actually in the process of screening now. Um, there, to date, there have been no known mutations identified, but, but we're interested to see if some of these, you know, in some of these cohorts, if we can identify uh, mutations in, in beta-4. So, Tom, um, from one of the textbooks, that I, I used to teach my um, physiology. Um, actually, it says that in the intercalated disc, the sodium channel is mostly 1.2, and 1.5 are distributed in some other places. Is that the right or just the I, species dependent? Yeah, I think at this point, um, so Mario Delmar and you know people like that have now done a lot of studies. <clears throat> and I think now it's safe to say that the primary population in the myocyte is 1.5 in the intercalated disc, and that the other, the, the neuronal isoforms are found at low levels elsewhere. You need a new textbook. Huh? You need a new textbook. <laughs> I need a new textbook. I, so, so, yeah, maybe, yeah. But so this is something that I, I, I you know, I don't want you yeah, to... Uh, so I, at this point, I think it's safe to say that, yeah, that, that right. the NAB 1.5 is going to be the population at the interplate disc. Even when I think, I think so you're, uh, yeah. you know, Bill, Bill Catterall made that statement in a very strong way, and then he sort of retracted it, but he already created a lot of confusion. And, and mm -hmm. well, probably where this textbook is coming from. And he published a lot of figures showing, I mean, right. the chemistry with, the, with, with different antibodies that were not very well validated. Yeah. So this is a, it came from Bill Catterall. Exactly. Sort of so it's uh, outdated. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so. good. There's Thanks. certainly no cardiac phenotype in the NAV 1.1 or 1.2 knockouts. Sorry. All right. <coughs> so, uh, so I, actually, we've addressed some of these points already. But going forward, um, you know, there are a couple really interesting questions. One is, you know, what other proteins are going to be important? And, and as <laughs> Dr. Reed points out, you know, these proteins have to be expressed in the same place as beta-4 spectrum. But there are there are a number of of interesting candidates, including potassium channels and uh, and uh, adherence junctions proteins that we're uh, very interested in going forward. Um, 
but but you know the first question that pops out is what what is bit of, what is this complex doing in, in other systems so most importantly the brain where we're actually beta 4 spectrum and cam kinase and sodium not NAV 1.5 but um uh, sodium channels that are known to bind to ANC-G, so that would be part of this complex, are uh, what, what is this complex doing in, in those cells? And here I show uh, just images from, uh, these are Purkinje neurons, so these are uh, cerebellar uh, sections that were stained from a wild type and 3J mice. And um, what, what I hope you can see is that uh, in a wild type, here I show uh, calbindin to, to mark the cell body, Cam kinase in red. Here I show uh, ANC G, which uh, in these neurons is, is known to be important for targeting uh, sodium channels to the axon initial segment, shown here with the with the arrow. And so uh, what we see in the 3J is that ANC, ANC G still is found as normal at the axon initial segment, but that that uh, cam kinase is just totally gone. Um, and so here you can see a nice localization of cam kinase to the initial segment uh, and, and nothing in the 3J. So going forward, we're, we're interested in, we hypothesize that actually this complex might be even more important in, in, uh, in the brain. And actually what's interesting is that um, if we look through the literature, there's, there's limited data on, on what cam kinase is doing at this axon initial segment, but uh, cam kinase beta knockout uh, is reported to have a have an ataxia similar to our um, our uh, 3J mouse. So it's interesting to to, to think about whether uh, loss of cam kinase from the normal uh, cellular lo uh, domain is uh, playing a role in the ataxia as well. Excuse me, Tom. Does it affect NAV 1.6 expression <coughs> at the axon initial segment? No. It doesn't. It doesn't. But we have um, so. These are all data from the, but I, I mentioned that there's a whole family of these proteins. So we also have the 4 j which is a truncation before the uh, anchoring binding site. And so we're going to repeat these studies. And so in those mice, we know in the heart that the sodium channel current is down by about 60%. Um, and so we, yeah, we'd expect to see in, in those neurons a loss of the 1.6. And then, of course, what what uh, what role um, does any of this play in in disease? And and actually, um, that I'll, I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, but I just wanted to return to this cartoon a little bit because, you know, this this is uh, again a, a, a short list. These are really interesting proteins. And so, uh, going forward, not only are we wondering what is what other uh, complexes might beta four spectrin be uh, coordinating. But, um, but we have this really nice list that include, you know, uh, other signaling molecules, PKC epsilon here, and uh, you can look through here some other some other uh, spectrons, um, obscurant. So it's an interesting list for us to kind of sort through and, and try and uh, characterize, you know, is this is this a homologous family of anchoring proteins for cam kinase? That's something I will be very interested in going through. Okay, maybe you said it, or maybe it was an answer to Catherine, but I, I probably missed it. But what is the phenotype of this mouse as far as the weakness? Of the 3J? Yeah. So um, at baseline, there's no, you know, we don't see spine. We'd actually predict that they'd be protected. So we, 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 went to, um, we went to cells, we isolated cells and used an ISO and challenge. And what happens to the mouse? The mouse is fine. The mouse lives a normal life, and it, has, and it has 60 percent reduction of its own. No, that's it. I'm sorry, that's a different. So that's a different mouse model that has a more severe truncation in its spectrum. So if I can get back to my cartoon, yeah. So the 3J, most of the molecules intact. You, so it still binds. It still can do all of its other st structural stuff. Um, it just can't bind cam kinase. So the, the other mouse model we're studying is uh, truncated right here. And so uh, that mouse we're studying now, we, we predict that mouse to be susceptible to like Brugada type arrhythmias. And so we're, we're actually studying that mouse with fleck and eye challenge and things like that to see if we can 
uh, if it's more susceptible to arrhythmias. But this, this mouse, because it just has this loss of CAM kinase binding, we'd actually predict would be protected. And um, we don't see, we haven't, uh, to, we haven't implanted telemeters or anything like that. We still have to form the channels of the mouse. Even, in, even with 40% yeah. of the sodium channel, it can still. Yeah, yeah, so we, yeah, we've tried different challenges. And, it, and we don't see, uh, again, we want to we wanna do, uh, we want to implant telemeters so we can look at awake anesthetized uh, EKGs. But um, we don't, yeah, we don't really detect any, any arrhythmias. What's interesting here is, you know, we don't see arrhythmias, and, and um, in a wild type of mouse, we don't, we don't see arrhythmias, really. So, um, but what, what we have started to do is uh, band, we banded QV3J and wild type mice, um, and we're getting, we're actually getting really interesting results with that. So it seems like the 3J, and it's very, very preliminary, but the 3J, uh, even out at, say, six weeks, still have relatively preserved heart function. So, uh, so those are studies that we're pursuing now. So can I ask you a question about your pie, pie chart again? So these are calcium, beta-1 and beta-2 subunits, right? In the membrane family. Where? C A C A. Yeah, uh-huh. Right. Those are the beta. So these are the beta subunits. This is CAM kinase. Right. And also the PLA. Which PLA is that? PLA to GFF. This is a. This is sort of one of these kind of question mark proteins. We don't really yes. know. So it's not phospholipase. No. Uh, a lot of these. So all these are undetermined function. This. Are you sure that's not phospholipase group two, group four? Right, the F variant. Um, I have to. I have to double check. Yeah, it's listed in the membrane. In your yeah. pie chart. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, so I don't. I, yeah, I don't know very much about that, obviously. Okay. But um, yeah, but these are these are uh, these are undetermined. Um, yeah, so we're still kind of you know we we all our effort has been sort of characterizing this, but now. Yeah, the next step is to kind of sort through this list and to look for some other. Um, but but calcium current seems to be quite affected here, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you haven't measured the L type calcium current yet. The regulation by chem kinase. Mm -hmm. um, well, so that. Yeah, so so that's pretty well established. That the that in that case it's the beta two subunit that's the anchoring protein. So I think each of these regulatory events are going to be mediated by a different anchoring protein. So I think for the calcium current, it's pretty clear that it's the subunits. For the sodium channel, it's you know going to be this, we think, the beta-4 spectrum. And then you know what, what other proteins are in this complex, we don't, or, or what, what roles these anchoring proteins are playing, or if indeed they uh, have any role in the heart, we don't know yet. So can you? Is spectrum also um, uh, expressed in atrial cells and Purkinje binders? So uh, it is expressed in atrial cells. Um, we haven't looked in Purkinje specifically, but yeah, it, it's expressed in ventricular atrial and sinoatrial node cells. So can you remind me how how did you decide? How did you find those uh, uh, lists? So we um, we started with the LXRQ. D or E, so we, we blasted for that sequence, um, and okay. and that's what we that's what we came up with. So, you know, the idea is that the um, I I don't show I don't actually I don't think the NR2B shows up on here, but the um, this site in the beta 2A was found because it has homology to another binding partner. Um, and this here in the CAM kinase is the, uh, the auto-regulatory domain. So this is the part of the channel that binds to the catalytic subunit and prevents it, keeps it silent until it gets, until calcium calmodulin is bound. Um, and actually peptide inhibitors of CAM kinase mimic that sequence. So um, the idea is that, you know, this sequence is, 
efficient at binding chem kinase? So chem kinase only act, uh, only um, acts with the with those associated the you know proteins. It cannot act uh, alone uh, to phosphorylate the target. Um, no, I think it. No, it can. It can phosphorylate. So if you have enough chem kinase in the cell, it'll find its partner. I just think that these binding partners facilitate the, the interaction. But yeah, if you just pump a bunch of chem kinase into the cell, it, it, it'll find its target. I just think that this helps. Local. Yeah, exactly right. Okay. So quickly, I just want to move on to a second part where um, now we're, we're looking at what role this uh, site plays in, this uh, motif plays in disease. Um, and actually, <clears throat> We, uh, we just screened I, uh, NI, LQT and other arrhythmia cohorts with undetermined mechanism. And actually, we found uh, a handful um, in this phosphorylation <coughs> motif. Um, two of these I show here are the A572D and Q573E, which are uh, variants linked to long QT. And what's interesting about uh, each of these uh, variants is that they're involve a charge substitution uh, proximal to that phosphorylation site. And so we, uh, we hypothesized that actually these uh, variants might be conferring arrhythmia susceptibility by uh, mimicking phosphorylation of the channel. And so uh, we actually, uh, we, we made uh, constructs uh, that not only of the, the variants, but we um, added a little twist by uh, mutating uh, cysteine-373, which is in the tetrodotoxin binding pocket of the channel. So we mutated that to a, a tyrosine, which uh, in the 90s was shown to affect the sensitivity of the channel. So we were actually able to create constructs that had a threefold uh, increase in TTX sensitivity. And uh, these, are, these experiments are done in HEK cells, but what this allows us to do is to separate the exogenously expressed channel from the uh, endogenous population. So the first thing we did is just to take these constructs and put them into HEK cells uh, with and without chem kinase. And uh, we found that at baseline, here I show a late current uh, and availability, that uh, at baseline these variants actually uh, functionally resemble the phosphorylated channel. So you have an increase in late current uh, along with a, a shift in availability. And then uh, I mentioned that we, uh, due to this trick where we're able to change the TTX sensitivity, we were able to put these, uh, express these constructs along with the wild type into uh, neonatal uh, myocytes. And uh, what we find is that in, the, uh, in both the Q73E and the A572D, we get abnormal repolarization and even uh, after depolarizations in the, in the case of the A to D. And that we can normalize uh, late current, I don't show that here, but we've also measured late current in these cells. We can normalize late current in APD with either TTX or, and this is a very low dose of TTX, or uh, renolazine, which is a sodium channel blocker, which is actually uh, pretty specific for the, the late current. Um, and then we were uh, able to take, take our uh, electrophysiological measurements from our, uh, our cell experiments and incorporate them into a, a sodium channel model actually developed in the, in the Rudy lab uh, and fit, fit our data from our uh, cell experiments, uh, incorporate them into a, a model of the whole cell and actually uh, re reproduce our, uh, our findings that uh, changes in the late current caused by these uh, mutations can produce an abnormal uh, late current and uh, after depolarizations, which we can uh, block with uh, renolazine. Uh, so that's, you know, those are uh, examples from these, these arrhythmia variants, which are, which are still quite rare. Um, we were also interested in, in what role uh, this motif might be playing in, in acquired disease. So we, we used our uh, phosphoantibody to look at uh, levels in, in uh, failing human hearts. And uh, we were able to find a, a dramatic increase in phosphorylated chemokinase, as well as uh, phosphorylated sodium channel 
in uh, non-ischemic human failing hearts. Uh, we've also screened uh, several different animal models, including uh, trans, uh, uh, aortic banding in the mouse, uh, as well as our as the canine uh, infarct border zone model, and we we have a similar finding where we see increased uh, levels in phosphorylation at serine 571. So uh, so now uh, I mentioned that we've uh, begun studies where we're, we're uh, doing banding studies in our uh, 3J mouse model uh, to try and really get at what what is the functional role for this uh, phosphorylation event. Um, and at least early findings suggest that not only might phosphorylation at serine 571 play a role in susceptibility to arrhythmias, but it might um, actually be an important step in, in progression of disease to heart failure. And so uh, uh, just to summarize that we've, uh, we've identified this new, new uh, site in NAV 1.5. Um, these variants appear to uh, confer susceptibility to arrhythmias by, by mimicking uh, phosphorylation. And, and of course, there's a precedent for this kind of um, mechanism where uh, defects in uh, accessory proteins or something like that lead to abnormal uh, channel regulation and, and arrhythmia. But we think this is a, these are two new members of that uh, unique class of uh, arrhythmias. And then uh, probably more importantly, we think that this uh, same kind of dysregulation is occurring in, in uh, common forms of, of heart disease. Tom, can I ask you a question? So Tim, Sam Dudley recently reported uh, alternative splicing in the Southern Channel, and he, right. he concluded that uh, in one of the variants uh, in heart failure patients, this particular variant is a essential predisposition for uh, arrhythmias associated with right. heart. How, how does it, this alternative splicing relate to the particular site? Um, so, so we've looked a little bit at it. It doesn't, it doesn't does it appear do to affect it, so it's in both. Um, but, but, you know, obviously that's a really, you know, important, important question. But yeah, the site is, the site appears to be in, in both. Okay. And then, uh, yeah, and then with that, I'd just like to thank um, members of the of the lab and, and our collaborators at OSU and, and here and uh, at Iowa as well as at, at Columbia. So uh, thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any any additional questions. Thank you, Tom. And uh, we asked a lot of questions, but are there any more questions? So, the D2 is, is mostly activation. With the voltage sensor open the closed channel, it does right. do inactivation. So, I was wondering if you think that D1, D2 are interacting with the inactivation gate. Yeah, so that, yeah, so that's a great question. We don't, you know, at this point we're not, you know, we know that the phosphorylation is occurring at that site, but then the link between the phosphorylation and the functional effects, we don't know. We've, we've talked to some structural biologists to try and model that event, and you know, maybe we could, we could talk some more, but, but it's a very floppy loop, and so it's hard to, it's hard to figure out what, what, what exactly structurally is going on. But I agree that that's, you know, that's an important question, is how, how is this phosphorylation event affecting inactivation? So um, everybody always talks about phosphorylation, but obviously there is enzymes that dephosphorylate. So are there phosphatases that are part of this complex, and are they? Is it through spectrum or anchoring? Right. Or is yeah. It known? Yeah. So we know. Um, so we don't. We don't really know the specific phosphatase for for the sodium channel in this case. We know that the anchorins can target phosphatases. Um, so ANC B. Uh, you know, the brother of ANC G can target um, PP2A, the regulatory mm -hmm. subunit. Um, ANC, ANC G doesn't bind, you know, or at least mm -hmm. in heart doesn't facilitate that interaction, but whether it could interact with other phosphatases, we don't, we just don't know yet. But there is a precedent for um, 
spectrin and associated, at least associated proteins for targeting phosphatases. Do you know anything about expression of different spectrum isoforms in human mice? Um, so we, in this study, we, we did check human tissue to make sure that at least protein is expressed. But you only did Western model. Yeah, we just did Western model. We haven't no done... where it's located. Yeah, so so we don't know. We'd love to be able to, yeah, going forward, look at, you know, do more detailed analysis in, in, in human cells. But we, you know, we do know that, that it's expressed in, at least by Western and human, dog, mouse. We, but it could have been expressed in neurons. Right. Not in my sense. Well, we, we've analyzed heart. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Because we, we see, you know, some of the structural proteins, unfortunately, not the same. For right. instance, neurofilament, yeah. uh, neuronal protein is expressed in the, in the Purkinje cells, it's sinus node cells, avian node cells, but only in the rabbit. So um, one, one data that, uh, so we were able to get sections of mm -hmm. human, and so we, we, we um, not only have we done Western blocks, but we were able to do some amino fluorescence or whatever, whatever that's worth, and we were able to see in tissue um, staining at the intercalated disc region. I mean, the, the tissue staining is always a little messier. We haven't been able to stain isolated human cells, but at least in tissue, we see it kind of where it should be. <coughs> okay, thank you so much.